So I'm Francesca Prantini and this is the Clarin in the Classroom uh, session. So what uh, just a bit of motivation for my uh, for this uh, for this session here. Um, there is a, so we said that uh, nothing beats the PhD the Clarin PhD student session and it's true it's very important but we also believe here at Clarin that uh, um, there is a strong uh, case to be made for using Clarin tools also uh, for uh, the classroom, so for teachers and lecturers, and we are aiming at building a strong community in this sense, and we would like to progress towards the creation of, uh, of a Clarin training suite. And uh, what's in it uh, for you, for lecturers and teachers, uh, the uh, possibility of getting possibly more usable tools and resources uh, to integrate uh, 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 resources uh, uh, in your syllabus uh, that are easier to use for you and for st your students, and also to find possibilities for collaboration and support. Uh, we've had uh, some initiatives before in this sense. There was a, a Clarin at Universities workshop, and then a Clarin Cafe on this topic. And then there are two uh, funding instruments, which uh, uh, maybe we will come back uh, to at the end of the session, that uh, are aimed towards uh, teachers uh, and uh, training. So. Uh, Keep also in mind in answering in, in uh, presenting your your work uh, uh, how can Clarin can help you and what we can do uh, to progress towards this uh, Clarin training suite. So um, just uh, before I restart, uh, some um, housekeeping rules. We have uh, eleven presentations, uh, so I pre uh, ask everyone to to uh, to stick to the assigned three minutes. Um, I will be operating the PowerPoints just uh, like Masia did, so please say next when I have to change uh, the slide. So um, you can put the, the public can put their uh, slide their questions in the in the chat. Uh, of course, for more specific questions, there's the uh, there's the poster style discussion later on. But let's try to have a little bit of discussion also uh, here. So without much further ado, uh, I'll go to the first uh, group of presentations that I gather together under the banner of corpora and linguistics. And we start uh, with uh, um, Mieta uh, Lennis, uh, who uh, is from the University of Helsinki. Uh, I come from uh, the Language Bank of Finland and Bin Clarin, and I uh, also teach online quite a lot. So uh, this is what I'm uh, talking about today. And um, well, Finn Clarin has a mission to offer uh, online courses every year. And um, uh, I usually teach three courses uh, every year. Uh, one of the courses I do twice. So uh, Corpus Linguistics and Statistical Methods, that's an introductory course that is given twice a year, both in Finnish and in English. And uh, introduction to speech analysis is about using acoustic phonetic speech analysis methods uh, and also about uh, speech annotation. And uh, this year it will be given in English also for the first time. And uh, data clinic uh, is an advanced course and that's for students who are actually starting the MA or PhD thesis. So uh, this is where you could uh, uh, take the next slide please. Uh, so uh, this course is uh, for students who will be using uh, text or speech as material for their research projects. And uh, the course is kind of special time-wise because it starts in November and ends in April, so it takes whole winter and spring. Uh, it's because it uh, is uh, intended for supporting the students during their work. Next slide, please. So the data clinic course is actually built around the idea of composing a data management plan. And that's, um, it consists of a series of uh, stages. So uh, these are of course more or less overlapping, but during them, the students can concentrate on, on the different aspects of the data management plans. And in each stage, the students are provided with uh, online learning materials and some exercises, and they can also get feedback uh, and help from their peers and from the teacher, that is me. 
And uh, the idea is to help the students to make uh, more informed decisions as to how they can, uh, well, efficiently process and analyze their data so that they can answer the research questions they have in their thesis. And also if their regular supervisors do not have time to help them with all the practical issues, so uh, this course can perhaps help them and add to their support. Um, during the course, the students uh, uh, submit one or more intermediate versions of their data management plans and that the final version of the plan is graded. Um, from the teacher's point of view, this is quite an interesting course to teach. Uh, of course, the basic data management issues uh, will prevail in scientific research and every researcher needs to deal with them, so this is useful. And it's also very healthy for the students to think about their workflows in concrete terms at the beginning of their study, so they can be perhaps more efficient. But as we know, methods and tools and software are under constant development and it's nearly impossible to keep track of all the tools and technical skills and background knowledge and uh, further studies that should be recommended or should be required. So I try to update and improve the course every year, but it seems that it's never finished. It's, it never uh, gets ready and I'm never quite happy with the contents. Uh, so obviously I cannot master all things under the sun and I need to borrow a lot of stuff from others. Um, anyway, so the external learning materials and resources are very important so that uh, they should remain accessible in the long term and, uh, and um, uh, these kind of uh, chunks uh, that we use in the course should be easy to replace or to remove uh, in case the content becomes outdated. So uh, many pieces of learning content can be useful in this course and in many, many other courses. So these are just a few examples of the topics. Uh, that I think could perhaps be implemented as, as uh, small and self-contained uh, learning objects or similar kind of things. Um, I'm under the impression that repositories uh, are being planned in many places. So uh, we also have a repository for learning content in Finland, but it's not fully integrated with library services yet, for example. Um, and I think the same issues apply to learning materials as to language resources in general. So this is where Clarion could definitely help with the localization and with the metadata and sharing and licensing and so on. So, uh, and this is a very international thing. So I'm hoping for a lot of uh, collaboration. Thanks. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, we go, uh to the second presenter, who is Laura Herzberg from the University of Mannheim. The floor is yours, Laura. Yes, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me well. Um, I would like to give you a short overview of how my colleagues and I are using Corpus platforms, as well as Corpus tools in academic classroom settings. Uh, our German linguistics department offers Corpus classes as an integral part as for the bachelor as well as the master curricula in a variety of study uh, programs. For example, as we can see here on the slide, it's the German studies programs, as well as the media, culture, and economy, uh, economy programs. We know that uh, corpora are also gaining an importance as resources in language teaching. So in our teacher training classes, the students learn how to use corpora with regard to their own future teaching career. The platforms and tools we explore together with our students are provided by the Clarion Centers um, of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences and Humanities and the Leibniz Institute for German Language in Mannheim. Next slide, please. Thank you. So um, how does a corpus seminar in a bachelor level study program look like? First, there's an introduction to the corpus platforms provided with the help of tutorials and complemented complementary tasks. Then the students receive an introduction to empirical linguistics and will also experience for themselves the limits, of course, also as the chances of corpus reach research. Uh, they develop their own linguistic question, for example, in the field of computer, computer mediated communication with topics that can range from analyzing comparisons of German registers, vocabularies, word pairs, to the investigation of spoken elements in written texts uh, or the creation of lexicon entries and how to find good examples for them. 
So step-by-step, step, they go over the processes of data selection, for example, from blogs, discussion forums, website or internet corpora. They study the literature in the field, they query and sample their data, they analyze it, and lastly, they discuss the results. They can do these projects by themselves or in groups of up to three people. Next slide, please. Thank you. And here we can see the student feedback in the speech bubbles. They uh, enjoyed the individual research work, the practical approach on linguistics, as well as getting to know the corpus tools and platforms. Another comment that I get uh, regularly from them is, um, that's not listed here, but that they would like to work with platforms that have very, very similar uh, search and query interfaces. Um, and lastly, as you can see on the bottom of the slide, in terms of wishes or needs or perspectives, I think a platform where teachers can exchange content ideas, best practices, how to's in general, uh, makes a lot of sense, or as it is written here on the slide, um, some kind of virtual space where we can talk about our challenges as lecturers, uh, possible, but also obviously possibilities that occur in our teaching setups. Um, maybe there's also the possibility to establish some kind of tandem groups or tandem courses, which then would again connect uh, different disciplines. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, so we go and move on to the next presentation by, uh, I guess it's Jurgita who is going to present. Uh, mm -hmm. And I hope you can see and hear me. Yes, we can. Okay, yeah. that's great. <laughs> hello, hello, everyone. Um, and well, yes, I, I would like to share our experience of integrating the Clarin content in, in, in teaching in the field of translation studies specifically. So what we first of all did, we compiled this monolingual comparable corpus of original and translated Lithuanian uh, with the intention to analyze uh, Lithuanian language variation. For us, it was really fascinating to see how for less resourced languages, uh, translations in, in certain genres, they uh, outnumber texts written in original Lithuanian and then how this affects language variation use uh, in written and spoken discourses. And now please, next slide. So as, as most probably all of us do this, uh, we shared our uh, corpus construction and, and research experience with the students that we teach. Uh, so in this way, Orvalet and, and Claren became integrated in, in one of the courses, Contrastive Stylistics, where uh, part of the course is specifically devoted to show students how to access and use electronic language resources and tools for their research editing uh, translation activities. Uh, so now, like by telling by, by telling the students what steps we undertook ourselves in creating and analyzing the corpus, we not only learn ourselves and 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 get interesting feedback from them, but also hopefully teach them to work with the resources and 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 tools taught in the local clearing centers. Uh, in our opinion, this helps them to get kind of broader picture of open access data and, and, and services offered by Clarin. Uh, I should say that the majority of our students, they are not experts in corpus linguistics and, and they, they, they don't have previous training or, or, or knowledge in that. So they, anyway, they get this basic uh, knowledge and awareness how to access the information they may, may need in the future. And then when you first show them the VLO, they very often they get lost. They, they see this amount of data and, and they're not always sure what uh, they need and how to find what they need. So our approach here is like we are first showing them the ocean of resources and then uh, we help them to discover the streams that flow into the ocean, the specific opera, the specific tools and uh, specific national uh, clearing centers. And now next slide, please. Mm -hmm. uh, yep, next slide. I think. Thank you. 
Uh, so what we first do, we introduce the theoretical background, like the features uh, of fiction from register perspective, various questions raised in corpus-based translation studies, and then illustrate the theory with, with our research based on the Orwelli data. Then we ask the students uh, to brainstorm on the possible corpus projects uh, and then create this pre preliminary uh, uh, data management plan. And then uh, uh, they get the feedback uh, uh, and, and uh, we discuss these things. And then the next step is to try out the basic functions of corpus analysis tools. Uh, they, they try to compare the word lists, keyword lists, concordances, and, and, and you see the uh, clarion centers that, that we refer to in our classes. Um, and in general, actually, well, our students, they are not prepared to work with uh, annotated data. So in the future, we plan to expand the Orvalid biome by in integrating, by adding uh, data, let's say, like extracted parts of speech uh, that they could analyze uh, uh, easily without even some kind of in-depth knowledge in, in uh, uh, tools for annotated corpora. Uh, and similar things. And now the last slide, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, well, of course, uh, due to various factors, uh, our course outline is not always that successfully fulfilled. And we have to adjust to various situations. Let's say like in spring, we were able to cover only part of the course. Uh, it is very important to get the, the classrooms fully equipped with, with computers so that the students could be uh, active uh, uh, participants, not only listeners. But in general, the, the feedback that we get is, is rather positive. They, they enjoy getting this information. They interested interested in it, uh, they just mark that uh, they would like to have more time on that, that maybe they would need the full course, not only part of the course devoted to these things. And I think that maybe would be more or less it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yurkita. <clears throat> uh, this would be the end of the first uh, uh, part. So I noted uh, already some interesting topics. Uh, so th there were a lot of, uh, uh, of um, yeah topics that came up, for instance, the fact that many courses were hands-on. Uh, I noted the lost in the Violo Ocean um, idea that uh, actually is, uh, is an interesting one. We can come back to that later on. So maybe we can then move on to the resources in the humanities uh, part. So the next presentation uh, is by Christian Power de Mighty and Daria Fischer uh, on the making of the uh, CIPARL tutorial. So we can, uh, the floor is yours. Hello, uh, thank you um, for the floor. I will present uh, what we learned during the creation uh, of a tutorial. And uh, next slide, please. Okay, perfect. Uh, so you might be aware that there are many parliamentary corpora for various languages in uh, the Clarion infrastructure. And these parliamentary corpora are a valuable resource because they allow cross-disciplinary and transnational research. Um, on top of that, um, these corpora can be searched through online concordance, concordancers, um, so they can be used by researchers without a lot of technical skills. Um, our goal was therefore to develop a tutorial that would showcase the potential of this richly annotated um, corpora by using the best known corpus analysis techniques in order to transfer the know-how from uh, corpus linguistics to other disciplines. Next slide, please. Um, what were our obstacles and solutions? The first decision we had to make was related to the choice of the resource and tools. Um, we tried to compare parliamentary corpora for several languages, um, but then eventu eventually gave up um, because the corpora were unevenly sampled and annotated. Um, and also they were, they were made available through different concordancers, which offer different functionalities. So in the end, uh, we opted for the NoSketch engine, which provides all major corpus linguistics uh, analytics analytical techniques, and for the CIPARL corpus, which is a corpus in Slovene, but is among the most comprehensive parliamentary corpora in the Clarion infrastructure in terms of size and annotations. The second thing uh, was the choice of the research problem. 
Uh, we wanted the tutorial to be relevant for a broad spectrum of international users uh, from different fields in social sciences and humanities. And this is why we stayed away from narrow linguistic research questions and Slovene specific phenomena. Uh, it was also important for us uh, that the demonstrated examples are embedded in contemporary research of parliamentary discourse and are, of course, methodologically sound. Uh, then we needed to decide upon the delivery format. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we conceptualized this tutorial as a self-study resource, uh, which is why we included a brief theoretical introduction, which is a prerequisite for appropriate formulation of the research questions and sound interpretation of the results. The tutorial is also rich in hyperlinks, and visualizations, but we also included screencasts for all the steps in the concordance in order to stimulate the users to actively engage with the corpus. And last thing, um, in the near future, we're planning uh, an expert review and a test session with students, but feedback from you is also most welcome. Uh, and I will put the link uh, to this tutorial in the chat after I finish talking. Next slide, please. Um, so, in conclusion, uh, we have learned that the development of tutorials is very time consuming and tutorials may need to be updated because new versions of corpora and concordancers are frequently released. Uh, second, um, because corpora are unevenly structured and there is a multitude of concordancers available, this seriously hinders the reuse of data and comparison in training settings. Um, this is why we strongly recommend Clarin to ensure common encoding of corpora and provide a common concordancer. And last thing, uh, cross-disciplinary and transnational collaboration is required to develop a body of training materials that would show the potential of Clarin resources and tools, which is why we would like to encourage closer collaboration of lecturers to contribute to the Clarin training suite. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we uh, are now moving over to uh, Federico Boschetti uh, talking about uh, clarinet from Pisa to Venice, Macerata and Syracuse. So uh, the floor is yours, Federico. Yeah, thank you. So I work uh, at the Institute for, Lingu for Computational Linguistics uh, in Pisa. And uh, we, as researchers of the Institute, have the opportunity to teach in many different uh, re uh, realities, many different uh, situations. Uh, please, uh, the next slide. Yeah, so we collaborate uh, with uh, uh, the universities uh, and we have courses at the University of uh, Pisa, in uh, which we make also a summer school on digital humanities uh, at the University of Macerata, where Monica Monacchini is uh, inside the PhD course, uh, at the University of Foscari of Venice with a, a master uh, uh, course, and at, also at the Venice International University in San Servolo. But we collaborate also with the high schools, in particular with the Liceo Classico uh, Gargallo in Siracusa and uh, the Liceo Classico Galilei in Pisa. And uh, inside the Institute, uh, we host also uh, the students that come uh, for internships. Please, the next slide. Uh, with the, the university, we have students that become aware of the open science, of the concept of fair data, the role of research infrastructures for the digital humanities and the computational linguistics. At high school, the very young students desire to feel part of a community, making resources useful for the others. This is very important for these young students that usually uh, consider them their homeworks just something that is made and then destroyed on the contrary when they realize that uh, they can participate in something that is useful for the community uh, they, they are very happy very involved in that um, and then they desire also to explore available resources that are relevant for their future studies uh, the next slide, please. 
So the weaknesses and the plans uh, that we have to overcome these weaknesses. The weaknesses are that students are only consumers of linguistic resources. Um, currently, we are collaborating with few universities and few students inside each course and the resources are targeted for the resource, not for the education. So the plans are to engage, uh, to engage uh, them uh, more and more in the productive process of the linguistic resources to have students that produce something. Um, we need to improve also the actions to promote uh, clarin in the classrooms, uh, uh, to make uh, awareness campaigns, uh, for example, inside uh, uh, the conference, the national conference. Uh, the, the next one is uh, the AI, AIUCD uh, conference, that is uh, yeah, the, the national uh, conference for the digital uh, humanities, uh, in which Clarin has uh, a big role. And then uh, to create uh, a, and adapt uh, the resources for uh, uh, educational purposes. Okay, thank you. So the next presentation. Uh, so hello everyone. My name is Victoria Milosenko Kopsiewicz, uh, and I'm a PhD candidate and lecturer at SVPS University of Social Science and Humanities in Poland. I use Clarin tool mainly for accomplished tasks in my research. Uh, recently, I came up with the idea how I can use this tool to combine teaching with scientific work. I teach academic skills uh, where students get familiar with reliable choice of source of information. So here uh, you can uh, see the goals of lessons uh, in my um, subject. So students uh, get acquainted with the concept of competent judges, examples of research uh, using qualitative data, uh, as well as uh, it will be uh, a perfect time to show students the process of searching words from their own category in text corpora. Those categories are chosen in the classroom and students uh, operationalize a definition of their category. Uh, and it's also a good time uh, when we can highlight the importance of being specific in the science. Last goal uh, is to show students the coding process of qualitative data in practice. And they will also have the opportunity to be a competent judge in, in this process. Uh, can you switch the slide? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so here you can see all the steps of coding process and place where clearing tools are applied. I will uh, only uh, mention those stage uh, when uh, in practice uh, those uh, tools uh, are used. So uh, literary exploration machine uh, and uh, two options, sentiment analysis and on category uh, are used uh, in the classroom. Uh, the frequency analysis of text as well as search for words for their own category is uh, uh, being done uh, by students. Uh, also, another tool uh, which is used is LexP and students can uh, recognize all the meaning of chosen words and pick the one which matches the definition. Uh, please change the slide. Thank you very much. Uh, and the last slide is about the uh, lesson scenarios. So uh, at the first lesson, students will get familiar with the basic terms, definition of competent judges, uh, text corpora, qualitative data, uh, NLP. Uh, I assume that not all the students have uh, um, uh, the knowledge about it. Uh, so I want to, the students to be on the same level, yes, to starting on the sa same level. Uh, also, uh, at the first lesson, students will choose the category they want to create. Uh, at the second lesson, students create text corpora as well as do the first stage of evaluation of words. At the third lesson, students do the second stage of evaluation meaning of what chosen in the first stage. And uh, uh, of course, uh, some work uh, will be done uh, by students in their, at their home. 
and uh, work in this subject is very demanding and in the end of lesson students will have a complex knowledge of working with clarion tools for their own linguistic research so thank you very much thank you very much so we've seen uh, three more presentations where uh, so students have become active uh, in the creation of resources uh, and at the same time, some problems have been highlighted also for discussion. So we move on to the next slot uh, with uh, three more presentations um, uh, on integrating computation, so to say. And we start with Simonetta Montemagni, Clarin in the Classroom at the University of Pisa. Simonetta, the floor is yours. Uh, we teach uh, uh, as a master course uh, computational linguistics within uh, digital humanities, uh, the digital humanities degree at the University of Pisa. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, the goal of our course is to teach uh, students the practical utility of uh, natural language processing and computational linguistics uh, in real world applications uh, with, uh, um, the, with, uh, with a specific view to the uh, social science and uh, humanities field. Uh, in particular, um, we teach how NLP and computational linguistics uh, can uh, be useful uh, to improve uh, uh, the, the knowledge about how human language uh, uh, works and uh, how um, these uh, tools and these methods can be useful to, uh, to study, to explore uh, humanistic uh, text, so text that are of interest for the uh, community. Um, in particular, uh, the focus of our uh, course is uh, on the uh, adaptation of uh, the uh, NLP tools and uh, resources uh, to uh, spe to uh, specific uh, um, language uh, variety, because uh, uh, we all know that uh, um, NLP uh, have to be adapted to, uh, to, to achieve uh, good uh, results, reliable results, uh, when they are uh, applied on different uh, language uh, varieties. And uh, specifically, uh, we, uh, we deal with uh, uh, historical varieties of uh, language, uh, with uh, different uh, texts on genre. And uh, uh, this year, uh, the, the main topic of the, of the course, of our course, is um, about uh, the processing of uh, social media text. Um, so the, um, our... Um, our students um, have to carry on a project uh, aimed at uh, uh, building a linguistically annotated corpus um, representative of a non-standard variety of language this year in particular, as I said, uh, a corpus of social media text that uh, um, is used as a benchmark to um, uh, evaluate to, to measure the performance of uh, natural language processing uh, tools. Uh, in the next slide, uh, we reported the resources and uh, the tools uh, shared uh, through Clarin that we used in our course. So, uh, as you can see from uh, uh, the the logos that we, we put in this slide, we use the universal dependency three banks. So the, the big effort uh, um, carry on to um, and aimed to build uh, um, a unique uh, uh, annotation uh, schema uh, to annotate uh, multilingual uh, three banks. Uh, so far, uh, we have uh, more than uh, five, uh, um, 150 uh, three banks uh, for uh, about uh, 90 languages. And uh, uh, we also use uh, uh, UDPipe, which is the uh, um, annotation pipeline, a linguistic annotation pipeline developed uh, at the Charles uh, University uh, in, in Prague. Uh, next slide. 
yes, uh, here uh, we um, we report uh, the the main steps of the of the project that our students uh, have to have to do. So, firstly, uh, we. Uh, um, uh, we give uh, to the to the students uh, a corpus a tw um, made up of uh, tweets uh, covering different uh, topics. Uh, in particular, this year we uh, we distributed uh, three main topics, so uh, three different uh, subcorpora, uh, including uh, tweets uh, um, uh, written during the um, Sanremo, the uh, the music festival. The Italian Music Festival, a second uh, um, corpus of uh, tweets uh, belonging uh, to the uh, Greta Thunberg uh, climate, uh, global climate uh, movement, and uh, a third uh, subcorpus uh, um, including uh, tweets written uh, in the uh, during the, the, the COVID pandemic. So uh, these uh, three corpora um, <clears throat> were uh, annotated um, by, uh, by students using uh, UD pipe. Um, next, slide. next slide, please. Uh, and so at the end of uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, steps, uh, they have uh, uh, an annotated automatically annotated corpus that they have uh, to manually uh, revise. Uh, they work uh, uh, in a team uh, uh, of uh, two students. Uh, uh, at this stage, uh, so during the manual revision, they have uh, to work uh, uh, independently. Uh, then they have uh, to compare their uh, uh, annotations uh, using uh, script uh, uh, calculating the inter, inter annotator uh, uh, agreement. So they can compare uh, the, uh, the output of their uh, um, annotation uh, choices. Um, and the third steps uh, concerns the uh, harmonization of their uh, annotations. So they have uh, to, to merge the, the two uh, annotations uh, in order to obtain a unique gold annotated corpus. And this uh, uh, gold annotated corpus is used as a benchmark to evaluate uh, two different uh, UD pipe models. Uh, so models uh, trained on two different uh, language varieties, in particular the social media language. So uh, they have to, um, to use the, the corpus to evaluate UD pipe trained on a, a Twitter tree bank and uh, the uh, and a model trained on uh, uh, newspaper uh, tree banks so they have to, to compare the different performance of the uh, of uh, ud pipe uh, in order to uh, to verify uh, the, uh, the the different in terms of performance uh, between the, the two models uh, in and out domain so in the next slide we uh, summarize how Clarin can uh, support uh, this, uh, this kind of project. Um, uh, Clarin, uh, we think that Clarin can, uh, can be um, the right um, place where uh, it can be created a platform integrating uh, different uh, uh, tools uh, supporting this uh, annotation uh, task. So a platform uh, including uh, an annotation editor. Uh, so um, students can be uh, supported by um, an editor uh, that can uh, help uh, the, uh, the, the revisions of the annotation, a tool of inter-annotator agreement, and uh, uh, modules measuring the, um, the performance of parsing, so in order to perform the evaluation of the uh, automatic uh, parsing. So a platform uh, including all these tools, uh, we can think, uh, we think that can be useful and can be uh, um, distributed uh, um, through uh, Clarin. 
So uh, we think uh, that- Julia, we're running a little bit late. So I think that your ex uh, three minutes are exhausted. So okay. can you please conclude? Oh, yes, uh, we just uh, would like to, to add that we, we think that this uh, project can be um, useful for students in order to uh, confront with a real world problem uh, connected with the use of uh, uh, automatic uh, uh, analysis of, of text. So thank you. So the next presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, so my name uh, is Katarzyna Klesa, uh, or people call me Kasia Klesa, uh, and I would like to highlight uh, my teaching experience to two groups of students. One of the groups is um, displayed here on the left, uh, we call it ELDO, and it's the group uh, studying the study program of empirical linguistics and language documentation here in Poznań. And this program is fully taught in English. So it's very international uh, in terms of uh, the group of students. We have students from many countries and uh, many continents even. The other group of our students is uh, the students of uh, computer linguistics or Lingwistyka Komputerowa in Polish. And this is mostly taught in Polish, but also some courses are offered uh, in English. Yes, and it, I published some of my curricula here on my website uh, at katarzyna.plesa.pl. You can see the address uh, at the bottom. Next slide, slide please. <clears throat> and um, so I prepared three slides about three kinds of courses that I teach. One of them is uh, corpus linguistics that I teach together with uh, my friend, my, uh, my uh, co-teacher. And uh, so during the first part of the semester, students uh, learn the basics of uh, corpus linguistics. And at the end of the semester, we have a couple of classes where I enter with my um, classes uh, during which I teach the students um, about the clarion tools just to demonstrate the possibilities that they have with uh, the clarion tools. So they explore, explore some of the clarion uh, corpus resources. We discuss also how these tools can become useful for their a MA diplomas and maybe also their future work, not only uh, research, but uh, some other professional um, tasks. Uh, yes, and next slide, please. Thank you. And the next um, area is documentary linguistics. Um, that's my other course, also to, to MA um, students for five ECTS. Um, this is more into the humanities. Um, so we learn more generally about the, uh, how to build corpora, how to explore archives of, of the data in the humanities, mostly linguistics. We learn about data and metadata standards. Uh, what we do here is to use clarion um, tools or resources mostly as examples, are, are as good examples of how can we can uh, formulate uh, or design um, corpora or, or archives mostly. Here we also practice some annotation tasks and uh, searching and, and so on. We compare also um, the Clarine tools or repositories to other uh, uh, resources, uh, such as the one mentioned here in the slide, um, the Poland's linguistic heritage um, database, but also Dobies or endangered languages and so on. So that's the second one. And the third, uh, next slide please, uh, which is the last uh, one uh, of my slides, but not least, uh, because it's very important to me as a researcher, uh, I teach experimental phonetics. I am a phonetician myself, so it's really uh, close to my core interests. And uh, this one is taught to students of uh, BA studies here in Poland. Um, and mostly here I use one platform, or may maybe two. One, the, the main one is the Clarion PL um, speech tools package. So uh, by using this package, my students simply get familiar with the fundamentals of graphing to phoneme conversion. They learn to, um, uh, to understand uh, the processes of automatic uh, segmentation, alignment, and so on. What is also important here, they learn about um, Clarin as a very 
responsive, very interactive uh, platform and, and group of people. Um, I exemplify this by showing my own tool that we uh, integrated with uh, Clarion tools. So my students also my, my students also learn about um, the fact that they can be part or become part of Clarion. And uh, here at the end, I just want to emphasize that uh, the Polish Clarion and Clarion in, in gen general is very, very um, uh, encouraging towards its users. So the, the users of the infrastructures, young people, uh, researchers and, and others. Yeah. So, thank, thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much. much. So we still have a free presentation. So Inguna, the floor is yours. Thank you, Francisca. Um, I would like to share our experience in Latvia, how we teach or how we use language resources of Clarin in our uh, classes. The next slide, please. Um, we are a rather small community in Latvia. There are only about two and a half million inhabitants. And that means that everybody knows everybody. And that also means that people who are developing language resources and tools are also teaching them. And that's, that is uh, our case. Uh, therefore, uh, my presentation is done uh, together with Ilse, Ausing and uh, Vibe Salid. And uh, we started uh, our computational linguistic course already in year 2003, when uh, ideas about Clarin were only in the air. And um, we started at the uh, University of Liepāja, and there were two tools, uh, courses, one for master students in linguistics and another one for master students in computer science. And uh, also both of them uh, were named uh, computational linguistics. The uh, content was completely different. We, uh, with linguists, we con uh, concentrate on corpora and lexical tools uh, and resources. While with uh, my, uh, computer science uh, students, we mostly worked on tools and uh, we need state automate and such things. And uh, these uh, computational linguistic courses uh, were at Liepa University for some 12 years. Uh, but now uh, we mostly teach at the University of Latvia. However, we have very good collaboration with uh, Liepa University and Ventspils um, College of Technical uh, Sciences, where they have this course for doctoral students, uh, novel approaches to linguistics. And in this course, uh, we have, I think, four lectures devoted to the computational linguistics. And again, it's mostly on corpus and corpus use. Um, interesting thing about this collaboration is that um, since uh, Lipa University is rather small, students who are our doctoral students are becoming uh, very soon teachers and then they are approaching us again and asking um, whether they can use our materials. So uh, our language resources and tools uh, become uh, more and more uh, widespread in the community of Latvian uh, scientists, researchers. So um, Latvia joined Clarin only in year 2016. And if we formally speak about uh, Clarin and Clarin tools, then we can say, is that uh, only this year we established Clarin repository. However, all our tools which we are teaching uh, already are in this repository or will, will, will be added very soon. So uh, uh, Clarin is our everyday life. And uh, what we teach currently, there are two courses. One is uh, computational ling linguistics for master students in English phil philology. And a completely new course we started this autumn for master students in, in Baltic philology. Uh, therefore, um, on next slide, I would like to share our experience with um, English students. So um, uh, when, we, when we started this uh, course, um, I approached Daria and asked, uh, well, English is a language which is well known and widespread and perhaps Clarin has already some uh, use cases which I can use in my uh, class classes. However, uh, uh, it turned out that uh, at that moment uh, there are not uh, such uh, ready made um, tutorials. And what we did and what we are doing currently, 
uh, we have uh, two classes uh, specify, specifically de devoted to Clarin. And in first, first class, um, I am telling about uh, infrastructures, uh, different uh, Clarin and ELG and ELRC and so on and so on. I'm showing virtual language observatory. We are speaking about language resource families. And then there, uh, there is coming this assignment for students. They need to look at Clarin website at VLO at uh, language resource families and decide what they want to research more and what to present to other students. And uh, on the screen, you can see results or highlights of results. So from last year, you can see that uh, students decide to show uh, other students Voyan tool developed by Clarin De DK, Denmark, graph call from United Kingdom and uh, uh, they, they are called from Germany. So Clarin is really in classroom because uh, students uh, take tools from different sites and uh, spread this knowledge between uh, themselves and our, our between us. What is interesting is that uh, uh, in the year 2017, uh, when we teach this class first time, there was a student from Finland, and of course she took uh, a Finnish uh, Clarin uh, repository, and she said, uh, Finnish Clarin is a paradise for scientists. So uh, let's move to the next slide. Uh, of course, we repeat this experiment with Clarin this year again, but uh, it's not ready yet uh, because uh, we, we only assigned students this task, but I don't have output which tools they prefer this year. So, um, uh, what uh, where I see problems and what um, I think Clarin can do uh, when we when when we have classes for Latvian students, of course we use Latvian tools and resources which we are familiar with. However, if you have English students, Finnish students, Russian students. For instance, last year we had uh, also the courses for English philology. There was, were also student, Russian students who studied Japanese. There were Erasmus students from uh, Turkey and Azerbaijan and so on and so on. So what would be interesting, and maybe we can do it with these grants of uh, teaching, we could try to make some kind of uh, table, some kind of block for all Clarin languages, where we put, for instance, for the best or uh, most suitable for classes, uh, corpus for Finnish is such and such, the best tagger or most suitable tagger for teaching for English is such and such, and so on, so on, and make such, yeah, something like a language resource family, but for teaching. <laughs> so, and uh, that's my proposal with, with which I would like to end. I only want to mention also on the right side, one, uh, this Azerbaijan uh, girl took this uh, tutorial from German Clarin, how to do uh, a word level based computational text analysis. This is a good example of tutorial, uh, which also could be extended to other languages. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we move on quickly to the next uh, two presentations. Uh, uh, the first one is uh, from uh, Mik by Miko Tolonen, Integrated Computation in the Humanities. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so when we teach digital humanities at the University of Helsinki, we are very much looking at the, at the question of how to integrate computation into humanities, which we mean other than linguistic areas. So we have very good language technology and corpus linguistics in, in at the University of Helsinki, so, but other uh, fields such as history, for example, they still need uh, thinking how to, how to do this. And, and one very important uh, platform where we've been doing this is for different reasons is, is the hackathon that we organize. And the hackathon is, is interwoven into our uh, teaching module for minor subject topic for digital humanities where's the kind of end course so everything else prepares for that so i'll just walk through you uh, with a couple experiences the point is that we've been uh, collaborating with clarin for for some years now uh, on this hackathon and and that is very fruitful hopefully for both of the parties next slide please 
So, uh, so, so one important thing that when we are thinking about humanities data and how to deal with it, we believe it's so different from other fields of science uh, that the best way is to think about digital humanities in general as an interdisciplinary field. So, so it really exists between the traditional field of humanities where it's applied and, and then data science or computer science. So collaboration is, is the key forward. Uh, next slide. And, and, and the concept of the whole hackathon it is, is that it's really a multidisciplinary event. So uh, somebody asked in the earlier in the chat how to incorporate um, computational literacy. Uh, so what we do for the humanities students who come with zero background in, in corpus linguistics or, or anything like that. So they take the introduction courses, they take computational literacy courses, and then they are ready to work in an environment where you have data scientists collaborating with you. Uh, next slide, please. And, and then the point is that, that we're really uh, learning the same language between uh, data scientists and the humanities people is the, maybe the best outcome in our experience, what we get out of this. So preparations take for the hackathon about six months before the hackathon, but then the actual event is only eight days. And, and there the point, very important point is that the computer scientists or data scientists can't be used as a IT support who are there to do some kind of a tasks, but the, how the research uh, questions are interconnected to the tasks that are taken, that, that's a very important part of the, the process. Next, please. Uh, as an example, so this is a uh, very international event. So we take uh, students from all over the place. Um, uh, there you can see where, where they're coming from, mainly from, I mean, most from Finland, but not limited to even Europe. Uh, and we limit the size of the, the participants to 40. Last 2019, we had something like 140 applicants or something like that. The backgrounds are very varied as well. And, and usually about most, half of the students have, have moderate or good uh, computer sci science skills. Next, please. Uh, so 2019, you can check uh, all of these results are documented fairly well in, on our website. So, so there's links. And also if you look at Heldic and Digital Humanities Hackathon, you can look at the poster uh, of, for example, this group that used the Clarin Parliamentary Corpora as, as their basis. And, and what we are really looking for from data providers, we also use other, other sources than Clarin, but for example, Clarin's uh, parliamentary corpora is, is extremely good for us. We really want to take a kind of a European perspective and have data that is interoperable. So the latest developments in Clarin with respect to these data fam families uh, have been very good from our perspective. Uh, the data is the key and, and the good data where you can answer real humanities research questions is, is relevant. I'm not going to start talking about what they actually did, uh, but we can talk about that later or, or you can check the, the website. Next, please. Thanks. Yeah, and this was, was the same. So, so also so, about the results. So, uh, so one thing, I mean, that obviously now uh, this year we, we actually didn't have the hackathon in multidisciplinary uh, interaction, you have to meet in person. And, and how to do this online in an online space in a very effective way with the same kind of things that we aim at uh, at the hackathon is something that we, we haven't even tried to yet solve. But, but this is also something that we now need to start thinking about in more, more detail. But I think, I mean, uh, go to our website, check if you're interested about this kind of a undertakings and I can explain how the uh, structure of the studies and, and this kind of courses where you aim for actual research collaboration, how, how they can work in practice. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we now uh, have basically one, uh, one per, per paper uh, section, which is I call collaborations. And it will be uh, introduced by Lonneke uh, van der Plas from the University of Malta. Is Lonneke there? Yes, I'm very happy to be here. And mostly actually because I could hear of all these things that people have been doing and uh, a lot of experiences here and this is exactly what I'd like to gather because we've just started uh, an Erasmus Plus uh, project which is called Upskills 
And what we're going to do there, one of the things we're going to do there is really try to foster research-based uh, teaching. And for this research-based teaching, we also want to involve uh, research infrastructures. So we are a consortium of eight partners. Uh, so University of Malta, where I am, uh, so we're the coordinators. Then there's the University of Belgrade, Bologna is there, Graz, Rijeka. Clarin is there, which of course is very nice because yeah, we can collaborate directly with you on um, uh, you know, integrating uh, Clarin into uh, teaching. Uh, oh, not yet, there was uh, still a while, two more. <laughs> well, anyway, there's Zurich and Geneva as well. They are there with their own funding. And then there's several associate partners, also industry, because we would also like to see if people can use uh, you know, uh, research-based, but then industry-related research-based teaching. Okay, next slide. Yeah, so what are the main aims of this, pro uh, this project? We want to tackle these um, gaps that we think are currently in the skills that students in language related disciplines have. So uh, yeah, people in linguistics, but also to people in translation, everything that's language related. Because we felt that right now, linguists are actually needed in many different types of jobs. Also sometimes a bit techy jobs, like all the lang language technology uh, firms are actually in need of linguistic knowledge, but often uh, the students lack some extra bits which we hope to be able to give them to be able to do good research and to be able to have a, a good job in, in industry. So yeah, things like critical thinking, problem solving, knowledge of research design, uh, how to annotate data, also project management and also digital skills. So yes, we have a lot of things that we want to teach them, <laughs> as you can see. So how do we want to do that? So one is we want to use some innovative pedagogy, pedagogies, oh, that's difficult to uh, such as um, online educational games. Um, so we're interested in seeing how we can use games for teaching. Uh, we want to do modular teaching and blended learning, and we want them to work on real world applications, hence the industry involvement as well. And the other thing, and which is actually very important for, for this uh, talk here, is that we want to be able to integrate existing research that, that the lecturers have into the teaching and also use research infrastructures. Next slide. Yeah, so we are going to inter, um, create some intellectual outputs. One is we're going to first do a needs analysis. We think that, you know, we've already talked to people, we've talked to students, we've talked to industry, lots of stakeholders. We know a bit what's missing in the skills of, uh, of, of students in language related disciplines, but we're not really sure yet. So we'll first do a very, very good needs analysis to know what uh, we should teach them. And then we want to create guidelines on how you can do research-based teaching. How can you involve uh, students in your research? How can you use re research infrastructures in your teaching? And that will also work on creating learning content. I saw a lot of talks also about that, people creating content that can be used uh, for online learning, for example. And the last thing is using uh, educational games to bring the learning content across. We've just started, so we're still very fresh and very open to all kinds of collaborations and ideas. And we have several multiplier events planned. And for each intellectual output, there will be a multiplier event. And this is where I think it would be great to see many of you actually who are here also in the session to, to you know, uh, exchange ideas and hear what your experiences are. So we'll have one for each intellectual output needs analysis, these guidelines on research-based teaching, learning content and educational games and you can see a bit about the dates when these will take place so yeah hopefully by then we will be able to meet in, in real life but we're not sure so yes we have uh, an advisory board where we talk to people uh, we plan to talk to people regularly to see if the, the project is going in the right direction and you know give us advice on the, the things that we're planning and uh, yeah that is also where i would welcome more people actually so if you're interested let me know uh, so we will stay in touch and actually I created um, a little uh, Google form where you can leave your details if you like and also what are your interests in the project so that we can contact you in case we have a, a nice event or if we want to include you in some kind of uh, um, um, yeah, event or whatever action, uh, in some kind of thing that we're going to plan for the project. So uh, yeah, I'll just share that link in the chat right now, and then that will be it for me. I think there was no more no more slides. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Lonneke. So uh, actually, the, I skipped to the last slide because uh, there's been a lot going on in the in the chat as well, and. Uh, some people are asking about mailing lists. Uh, we have a mailing list also for the Clarin training initiatives. Uh, 
it can be found at this link. So uh, maybe I can also, someone can copy it in the chat. And of course, uh, also the UpSkills pro project uh, will give us uh, a possibility to stay in touch.